All right, so we just have a few things to finish up tonight on biochemistry before we move on. Uh, the next thing that we'll be talking about once we finish up with biochemistry is we're going to begin to look at anatomy and physiology at the cellular level. Uh, so we, we were talking about enzymes uh, last Monday and just basically going through the process of enzymes, uh, identifying and, and defining nomenclature for uh, enzyme uh, naming and uh, where I'm picking up now is I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the things that can change the efficiency of an enzyme. So remember, an enzyme is converting um, a product into, or a reacting into a product, so it's catalyzing a chemical reaction. And the rate of that chemical reaction can actually be <laughs> altered, it can be slower, or it can be faster. And there's a few things that will actually change the rate of the enzyme. One of the big ones that's biologically important is going to be pH. As we increase and decrease pH outside of the normal physiological range, which typically we say is between about 6 and 8 uh, on the pH scale, as we move outside in either direction, hydrogen bonds get disrupted of the in the enzymes, and the active site where the, cat, uh, where the reaction is being catalyzed actually begins to sort of fall apart. And so it doesn't do its job as efficiently. So when we change pH, that's going to have an effect. Another big effector of enzyme activity that's biologically important is going to be temperature. So both pH and temperature are going to disrupt enzyme activity. And drastic changes in either of these can actually result in not only reduced, but elimination of function as well. And in fact, when you have a fever, which would be an example, a biological example of an increased temperature, the bad feeling that you get, it's not just because you're sick, it's actually because your enzymes are going through this denaturing process where they become less efficient, and so your body's not working as well. And that's part of the reason that you really just don't feel that well when you have a fever. Now, there are also going to be some biological factors that are going to help to change the function and efficiency of a enzyme. Uh, and these are going to be things that are naturally produced, molecules that naturally occur, that are going to either enhance or provide some sort of new function. We call these cofactors or coenzymes. And so a cofactor or coenzyme will be a molecule that will bind to the enzyme and it will actually cause the enzyme to maybe become more efficient or it may totally change uh, the enzyme to begin to provide a new function and may actually change the chemical reaction that it's catalyzing. So cofactors and coenzymes, they will bind to the enzyme at what we call an additional site. So bind an enzyme at an additional site. You already are aware that we have this thing called an active site, which is where the chemical reaction is actually going to occur. <laughs> But we're going to have another location, and we may call it the cofactor binding site or the regulatory site. And these cofactors or coenzymes, when they are present, can bind to that region of the enzyme. Anytime we bind a protein, we, what happens? We bind something to a protein, the protein changes form, changes form and that results in a change in function. So these coenzymes and cofactors can change the form, then the function of the enzyme by binding these additional sites. And again, this can result in some sort of activation process or so this would enhance enzyme activity or it may even provide some new alternative function. So really the Take home message for enzymes is they're not just simply catalyzing reactions. They actually can be changed so that they increase or decrease their efficiency or even change their function uh, slightly. 
All right, the last thing I want to talk about here in this biochemistry section, and that's supposed to be a nine, uh, I want to talk about the molecule ATP. So ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. The reason that I'm going to highlight this molecule is because it's a very important en uh, energy intermediary. This is going to basically be what all of the work in the cell is paid for with. We're going to use ATP, or if we're not using ATP, we're going to use some sort of analogous structure such as G GTP where we take the adenine and we swap in guanine. It's still going to be a nucleotide with a, uh, three phosphate groups attached. Uh, so it's going to give us really that same function because the function for energy comes from the phosphate groups, not from the nitrogenous base, not from the adenine or the guanine. Okay, so ATP, yep, it's our energy currency in the cell. And the reason that this is so valuable for us for energy purposes is because the second and the third phosphate bonds which you can see here and here those two bonds remember they're holding electrons at a specific location away from the atomic nucleus in, uh, in relation to the oxygen and the phosphate by holding those electrons in that specific position we have a certain potential energy, right? Because potential energy is location dependent. So where the electrons are held away from the atomic nucleus is going to define the potential energy held in that bond. And it just so happens that this orientation or this type of covalent bond is going to have a high potential energy. And it's because of this high potential energy that when we break that bond, we can release that potential energy into a usable form. We can liberate the potential energy into a usable form of kinetic energy to operate chemical reactions inside of the cell, enzyme function inside of the cell, to so move things around the cell. So ATP can be catalyzed to form ADP, which is going to simply just be a loss of our third phosphate group. And when this happens, of course, this is going to yield heat, as all reactions do. And that's actually going to be most of what is produced is going to be heat. But we are also going to get some energy. And that energy is going to be available for work. And so we say, since it's available, we say that it's free. Not free as in doesn't, doesn't cost anything. Free as in, hey, yeah, I'm free. I can go to Walmart with you tonight. So it's available for some sort of purpose. And really, that energy for work, this is really just what's basically left over after we've lost our heat. Okay? So whenever we see an energy demanding process, we are going to see ATP. It's going to be someplace close by in a schematic or a model that we may be looking at. Now, on top in this figure here, this item right here, this is the chemist's rendition of ATP. This is not chemistry class. So you got to know the biology shorthand, which is just simply ATP with the lightning bolt around it. Okay, so you're going to see in a lot of our figures will have this ATP symbol you know that it's going to be using energy, and you should also expect to see that that ATP is going to be converted into ADP as that chemical reaction occurs. Okay? So we'll see that frequently throughout the next parts of the semester. All right. So let's go ahead and shift gears. Uh, you can go ahead and start with a new lecture, start over with a new outline. At Point number one. If you want to call this something, you can call it cellular anatomy and physiology or cellular A and P. And basically, I'm going to use this portion of the lecture to talk about cells. 
and introduce you more detail about cells. Really, cells are going to be where biology happens. Uh, in fact, cells are uh, really the language of biology in one, in, in one sense. You know, English, you go to a literature class, and the English language may be the language of communication. Or you may go to a geography class, and maps are the language of communication. For biologists, it's the cell. And everything that happens at the cell is going to have consequences for humans in the whole organism. The reason I can move my muscles right now as I walk back and forth while I'm lecturing and actually can speak is because of what's happening at the cellular level. So cells are really, really important to the biologists. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't start a conversation on cells with what is now known as the cellular theory. This is basically the best way that we can succinctly uh, summarize everything it is to be a cell. And I want you to be intimately aware of three of the tenets. There's actually five. I'm going to show you all five of them tonight. Uh, but I want you to be aware of three of the tenets of the cell theory. And this figure here, um, just a nice Google image that shows these three uh, most important uh, tenets of the cell theory and also gives you an idea of uh, who was involved in writing this tenet uh, of the cell theory. So the first tenet that we need to be aware of is all living organisms are composed of cells. So all living organisms are composed of cells. So let me give you a couple sample organisms, and you tell me if they are living organisms or not. So bacteria. Okay, it's living. Uh, eukaryotic cell, like a human cell. Living. How about a virus? Not living. And why is it not living? Because it's not composed of a cell. Okay. So if we stick. Strictly with the cell theory, with these tenets, which I think is the best starting place, then it needs to have cells in order to be a living organism. Everything else is going to be non-living. Now, we can also go in the other direction here with cells, and rather than building up towards organisms, what if we break them down to organelle? So mitochondria, is it a living organism? No, it's just a part of a living organism. We do not get to living until we are at a full cellular entity. <clears throat> Which leads nicely into the second tenet, and that is the cell is the smallest unit of life. Smallest unit of life. And what that means is if we go below the level of the cell to the level of organelles, even though these are required for life, on their own, they are not living systems. It's kind of like saying you have screws and bolts and nuts in the engine of your car, but they in themselves are not an engine. They are just parts of an engine. We need to get to the organization where we have all of the parts, all of the organelles, wrapped up in a phospholipid bilayer before we can actually say that we have a cell. That's going to be the point in which life begins. All right, uh, C here, cells come from other cells. So cells come from other cells, which is a very interesting statement. And you'll see all cells uh, on the figure here, all cells come from existing cells. This is from Rudolf Virchow, and you can see a picture of him here. And really the idea here is that cells need to be regulated by things like the cell cycle, so that you get new cells from old cells and new cells from those cells over and over and over again. So the question becomes, where did the first cell come from? Was there a first cell? I don't really have the answer to that, but it's worth thinking about. I think that's like the main like mystery of how God created. Like it's, it just remains a mystery. Like that's how I think. I think about it. Like the chicken or the egg. 
Yeah, it's kind of a chicken or the egg question. I guess if I can give you just maybe a minute or two on this, my opinion is that this is established at some point. This is not constantly true. And what I mean by that is life has not been eternal on this planet. Life has a beginning point. And it doesn't matter if you come from a creation perspective or you come from an evolutionary perspective. There is a lot of agreement on that. If you believe that life started 3 billion years ago on the planet, it had to have been a cell that originally formed uh, sometime, in only, it would be about 1.6 uh, billion years after the Earth had formed and about 17 billion years after the Big Bang, we would eventually have a cell that was the first cell and cells all came from that. Or it's very possible, and this is where I lean, that this cell was one of God's first creations or it was the concept of the cell that was part of those first days of creation that are accounted for in Genesis. you got animals being created, they need to have cells. And so alongside of creating man and animals and plants is the whole concept and understanding that cells are inherent in that creation. So I don't think that this is necessarily a comment or a statement on life has always existed. This is conditional on life having begun at some point in history. All right. Um, other accepted parameters. I told you that there were five tenets. The first three that we've talked about are paramount in biology and in uh, physiology. There are three additional, or two additional parameters, I should say, that uh, when stacked together make the five tenets of the cell theory. And I just want you to sort of be aware of them. These are not as important as these first three. These first three are fundamental. These other two are important, but not the fundamental foundation of the cell theory, cell theory that we have from these first three tenets. So one of these other accepted parameters is that cellular activity. Oh, and by the way, these, these three tenets were the, found, the first foundation. We've added these other accepted parameters in historical time. So cellular activity... Cellular activity defines form and function. And you could state this another way. You could state that the way the cell acts is going to define what the cell looks like, which ultimately defines, defines how the cell is going to function. Okay, the second... Uh, accepted parameter here is the composition or relates to compositional and metabolic similarities. And so what exactly does that mean? I don't think I really spelled similarities quite right there. Close. <laughs> Whatever. It's similarities. <laughs> so compositional and metabolic similarities, what exactly does that mean? Well, we know things are cells because they have things like phospholipid bilayer. They have genetic material. Now, where that genetic material is a little bit different, whether it's a prokaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell. Um, so there are some differences, but we're still going to find some very similar compositional makeup. Also metabolic um, similarities. We're going to have the same types of chemical reactions occurring. A single cell yeast organelle, uh, I'm sorry, single cell yeast, single cell yeast organism is going to undergo glycolysis just like your cells as a multicellular human organism can also be undergo cellular respiration and glycolysis. So there are some similar metabolic activities that are occurring. Now, we're going to come back to this next section here, but I want to just introduce it since we are talking about cells. We're going to come back, and as we begin to organize cells into tissue, and then tissues into organs, uh, we're going to begin to uh, take a look again, just like we did in the histology lab uh, just a few weeks ago, 
uh, to look at the types of cells that are present. And you're going to begin to understand what actually is a cuboidal cell or a columnar cell in a little bit higher detail. But before we do that, I want to give you a good introduction to cellular anatomy and physiology and just briefly introduce to some of the general cell types. And I have nine different cell types that I want you to be aware of. Now the thing that's really interesting about this is most of you have seen pictures, and in fact there are pictures in your book that represent cells, and they're called the stereotypical cell, or the stereotypical model. And it's basically a collection of a variety of different types of cells that represents those cells in general terms, but none of those cells specifically. So if you flip open your textbook and you find the stereotypical cell, you're never going to find a cell that looks exactly like that anywhere on the planet because it's a collection of all of the attributes of a variety of different cells. In reality, we have a much higher diversity in cellular structure than just simply a stereotypical cell. Even this list of nine general cell types doesn't really do it justice when we begin to look at all of the different types of cells that are out there. These are just nine uh, really broad, sweeping, spectral type categories that we can begin from. Uh, when we go into some of the uh, physiological systems that we'll talk about this semester, bone, you're going to see some very unique structures in bone cells. We're going to talk about skeletal muscle, and you're going to see some very unique muscle uh, or uh, structures in skeletal muscle and in the nervous system as well. So again, these are just general cell types. This is not the nine types of cells that we can scrape off of our body and we'd be able to observe them. All right, so the first type is referred to as a squamous cell. And a squamous cell is going to be a scale. And when I say scale, I'm talking like a scale from a fish or a snake. So it's going to have a cell-like shape. It's going to be sort of thin and flat and resembles in one accord a fried egg. That's not egg, that's egg. <laughs> Off to a really good start today. Okay, so resembles a fried egg. So just to kind of sketch this out just a little bit here, that would be a general squamous looking cell. The nucleus is what I've drawn here, and I'm going to fill in just a little bit in yellow. Uh, and then the cell has sort of a long, a thin, flaky type appearance. And we've seen squamous cells. You observe them in uh, epithelial tissue samples that you've already observed during the lab. The next are going to be cuboidal cells, and you've seen these as well. These were a cube-like shape. So they're going to appear more or less like a box. And since they're cubes, they're going to have near equal sides. OK, so check out my artist rendition here. Something that's going to look a bit more like that. That actually looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? There's a nucleus. Okay, so there's going to be cuboidal cell, and you've also seen those when you were looking at some histology samples just a short while ago. You've also looked at columnar, and these are going to be overall more of a column-like shape. So rather than being a box shape with equal size, we're not going to have more of an elongated shape. And so this is going to actually have <coughs> a couple of the dimensions that are a bit longer. Hopefully these first three look somewhat familiar from some of the lab activities that you've already done.
We also see some geometric shapes. Uh, there's a uh, type of cell called the polygonal cell, uh, and this is going to have many sides. So many-sided cell, uh, maybe hexagonal in shape. So it represents more of a geometric type shape. May look something like that. Number five, the fifth general cell type is the stellate cell. Now, hopefully you can see in stellate, you might see the word satellite or something similar to that. So a good way to remember this is that it's going to be near the stars, so to speak. So this is going to be a star-shaped cell. And the star-shaped cell, it's going to have pointed protrusions. And there's a couple places we find stellate. Too. <laughs> we have stellate cells that show up in a variety of different tissues. Two of the most common are going to be within the nervous system. Uh, and so we're going to find glial cells that have a stellate shape. And then also there are hepatic stellate cells, which are uh, found in the liver. Batman symbol. Poorly drawn. Poorly drawn. That man hasn't really been uh, taking his medicine for the last couple of days. <laughs> okay, our next type of uh, cell, general cell type, is the spheroidal or the ovoid type. And this is going to be a ball shaped cell. And then if it's more of the ovoid rather than the spheroid, that ovoid shape just simply means it's going to be a little bit elongated. So it just has one dimension that's a little bit longer than the others. So spheroid is going to be very spherical, ovoid will be a little bit more elongated. Our next general cell type is the discoid, which is a disc-shaped cell. And um, we're going to find these actually, in, in red blood cells are one of the most common um, examples of the disc-shaped uh, cell. Um, I'll try to draw it. It's kind of hard to draw these because this is a little bit more advanced than my skill. But it really looks like a couple of DVDs that are stacked together uh, on top of each other. So you basically, I guess in the sort of in a cross section, if you will. The cell looks something like that, where there's a, a narrowing in the middle of the cell. If we were to draw it and look at it from above, it would look something sort of like that. If that helps. Do you guys ever take those exams where they would like have like a three-dimensional figure on a flat plane, and you'd have to like draw what it looked like from to their hand angle? Or you have to do that ever? I don't know. We had to do that in elementary school, and I was really good. At it. <laughs> I know it was well. I mean, like we got to use rulers and stuff, so I, I'm not gonna handle it. <laughs> but yeah, I was really good at like they give you, you know, if it looks like this in one direction and it looks like this in another direction, what is the overall structure of this? And you'd have to go through and use the information that you got. And 
How do I remember that? Because I paid attention when I was in elementary school. <laughs> well, we could pull you in, but we never do. Yeah, this way is going to be like a red blood cell. You guys pretty much are uh, the meanest group of students I've ever had. <laughs> All right, uh, two more to go here. Fusiform is going to be the next one, and this is going to be an elongated spindle. So the cell might look something like that. And the last cell type is fibrous, which is going to be a long and slender thread. cell takes on this really long, slender, thread-like appearance. All right, so nine general categories with nine very nice pictures to help you understand those different categories. Is everybody good? Everybody have what they need? What I want to talk about now is cell size and the restrictions that are placed or that are the result of cell size. Okay, so cells are small. I think everybody can agree with that, right? And really the question becomes, why don't we see cells that are bigger than they are? Before I talk about the restrictions and the biological reasons for those restrictions, I want to talk just briefly about some of the dimensions and the measurements that we're going to use to measure cells. So cells are measured in micrometers. Okay, micrometers, that's 1,000 micrometers in a millimeter. The symbol that we use is the Greek letter mu followed by an M, so micrometer. And there's a thousand of these in one millimeter. Does anyone happen to know what our biggest cell type is or what our biggest cell is in humans? Oh, isn't it um, the, the female reproductive Yeah, female reproductive system, what's it called? Ovum. Ovum. So the biggest cell is going to be the ovum, and dimensionally, this is going to be about 100 micrometers, about 100 micrometers. And what that means is we can actually see this type of cell with our naked eye. And in fact, just as a reference, if your textbook is open, take a look at the period at, a, at the end of one of the sentences, and you have a rough approximation of this biggest cell. It's still really, really small. The average size of a cell is going to be on the order of 10 to 15 micrometers. And these are, these are diameters that I'm giving you, the diameter of the cell. So 100 micrometers diameter or 10 to 15 micrometer diameter for the average cell. This is really small. We can't actually see this with the naked eye anymore. We're going to need assistance from microscopes. And we can get at it with a light microscope at um, uh, a pretty small amount of magnification, but we're still going to need that microscope. What does it say after 10? 2, 15. So why is the average size, and, and why are we no bigger? Why is the average size 10 to 15? Why are we no bigger than 100 micrometers? What are the biological reasons for this restriction? Why can't we be any bigger? I can tell you that from a biologist standpoint, it would be great if cells were bigger and we could actually just grab on them and do whatever we need to do to understand disease and things like that, but that's not the case. 
And there's a really good reason why they're not any bigger. And it all comes down to a ratio. A ratio between surface area and volume. So this relationship between surface area and volume is going to be very important for dictating size. Now I want to talk to you about what surface area means, what this is actually referring to in volume, what that is actually referring to, and why when these are taken in ratio, we get a good predictor of maximal size. So first I want you to consider increasing the diameter of any given cell, just doubling it, so a 2x increase in diameter. Over here in this figure, what we're doing, we're actually increasing from this small little cell here to this cell here. We're actually increasing by a unit of 5. So that would be a 5x increase in one dimension. We're going to just consider a 2x increase in diameter. So every time we increase the diameter of a cell, so here's our cell, here's our diameter, and then if we double the size... the diameter increase or multiply it by 2, the cell gets bigger. Surface area increases, so this dimension here is going to increase in response to that increase in diameter, and then the volume, what is inside of the cell, is also going to increase. But herein lies the problem. They do not increase in a direct proportion. With a double of the diameter, we actually have a 4x increase in the surface area. Now, the surface area in that 4x increase is going to relate to how well we can serve the regulatory nature or the how well we can serve to regulate cellular metabolism. <coughs> So it's, the surface area serves to regulate cell, cellular metabolism. In other words, the surface area is directly related to the cell membrane. And as cells get bigger, as we increase the diameter of the cell, we have to increase the surface area by a factor of four. Now let's take a look at the volume. What is the volume going to relate to? Everything that's on the inside of the cell, which is going to be metabolic reactions, proteins, organelle, cytosol. Everything inside of the cell is what relates to the volume. The greater the volume, the bigger the volume gets, the more chemical reactions that are required to maintain the cell function the more waste that's now going to be produced, the more oxygen that's going to be required, and the more nutrients that are going to be demanded. It would be optimal if every time we increased the diameter, if we had a proportional increase in surface area and volume, but we don't. We actually increase volume by a factor of 8x. Now, the reason that that is, is because of the way in which we measure surface area and volume. Surface area is a two-dimensional factor. If it's simply a cube, the surface area would be this length times this length to get the surface area here and then multiplied by 6. So it's real easy to do it in cubes. In spheres or things that are irregularly shaped, we're going to use a little bit higher level math and probably some calculus to get the, the actual area. Okay? So just kind of focusing here on these two cubes here. To get the surface area, I would multiply each, uh, the length and the width of, um, of each of those spaces and then add it all together. Since it's a cube, I can just multiply by the six sides. I can calculate one of them and I multiply by six. So you can see total surface area here is six. One times one multiplied by six. Okay? 
Over here, we're going 5 times 5, which gives me 25, multiplied by 6 gives me 150. So that change from 6 to 150 in response to increasing the dimensions by a unit of 5 is a pretty big, pretty big jump from 6 up to 150. Now take a look at the <coughs> total volume. The volume, I'm going to multiply the height, the width, and the depth. So 1 times 1 times 1. So I got a total volume here of 1. If I go over here, it's going to be my height and my width and my depth. When I multiply that up, it gives me 125. So my surface to volume ratio exhibited down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see is drastically different. It would be optimal if every time I increased the diameter or one of the dimensions that we didn't change our surface to volume ratio but it always changes, and it changes disproportionately. Now, what are the biological consequences? If we have a 4x increase in surface area, when we increase or double the diameter, and that's serving to basically bring, that's the, that's the membrane, and how well we can bring oxygen and nutrients into the cell, and how well we can get rid of waste products, then when I give uh, uh, that increase in the volume, it's going to be an 8x increase. And what results here is I have more cytosol. So I have more cellular solution inside of the, of the cell that is filled up with more enzymes, more chemical reactions, all producing and requiring, all producing more waste, requiring more nutrients. And so I'm going to put this down as more cytosol to produce an increased metabolic demand. And I'm using the term metabolic demand here just to simply state the collective, uh, the collection of bringing nutrients and oxygen in and removing waste products. So more volume means more metabolic demand. Increases in surface area means better ability to regulate that cellular metabolism. We can better meet the uh, metabolic demand with a large surface area. But because we have this disproportionate increase in surface area to volume, we're going to get to a point where the surface area no longer is large enough to supply that increased metabolic demand. That happens right around 100 micrometers in size. That's about the upper limit of, of a cell. Because at that point, we're just able to cover the metabolic demand of that cell through our surface area, our membrane. And if we go above that, we get more cytosol and more metabolic demand, but not as much of an increase in our surface area or cell membrane to meet that. Does that make sense? I'm going to give you something for free tonight. I wasn't really going to talk about it, but I think it's okay to talk about it, so I don't really have notes for this. Um, but there's also a lower limit. So that's the upper limit. The upper limit relates to that surface area to volume relationship. What about the lower limit for cellular size? So I have two drastically different cell models here that I've drawn on the board. Inside of all of our cells, whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic, we're going to have genetic material. Really, the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells is just where we store our genetic material. Eukaryotic cells, we pack it away in a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells, we leave it out uh, and just kind of shove it into one corner of the cell. Doesn't really matter. Ultimately, what comes what it comes down to as we decrease the size, so as we go from this larger cell to this smaller cell, the volume of the cell decreases. This is a volume that can hold a large amount of DNA. As I go over to here, I have a smaller amount or less DNA that I can hold. Now, as I shrink my DNA molecule, 
I have to get rid of stuff, right? I can't just continue to pack it up infinitesimally small. I gotta begin to get rid of stuff. And so as the cells become smaller and smaller and smaller, I lose more and more DNA. Eventually I'm gonna get to a point where that DNA molecule is so small that I don't have all of the required genes to produce all of the required proteins for that cell to survive. Now we really don't know the smallest that a DNA molecule can be and still sustain life. There are some theoretical limits, and there's one cell that we know about that has a really small genome. It's called nanoarchaea quantins, and it actually has 500 nucleotides, just under 500 nucleotides in its genome, and it produces a very small number of proteins, and it is still a living system. Now, if I take nanoarchaeum nano aquantins and I remove some of the nucleotides from that 500 base pair genome, I'm going to lose some proteins and that cell pretty quickly is going to no longer be metabolically viable. It's no longer going to be living. So our surface area to volume relationship, that ratio defines how big a cell can be. The capacity to hold DNA is going to define the smallest the cell can be the lower limit. Does that make sense? Is everybody sort of tracking with me? So those are the biological reasons for the sizes of cells that we have on the upper end and on the lower end. All right, so we've talked a bit about the cellular surface, the uh, cell membrane, and I want to talk a little bit more specific now. Because in all reality, there is a ton of stuff that goes on at the surface of cells. In fact, there is a lot of physiology that happens at the cell surface that defines how organs and organ systems are going to work. I got a picture here, just a cartoon model of what a cell membrane would actually look like. So this is going to be the cellular surface. And at the cellular surface, we have a cell membrane. Now a cell membrane, you have maybe heard before that the cellular membrane can also be called a plasma membrane. Has anyone heard that before? That's actually not true. Those are not synonyms. The cell membrane is a unique specialized type of a plasma membrane. We actually find plasma membranes also in eukaryotic cells around the mitochondria and the Golgi complex and the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus. Those are all plasma membranes as well. It's a specific type of membrane. So you should use the term cell membrane when you're referring to the membrane that wraps up the entire cell. So it's just going to be a type of plasma membrane. The cell membrane and other plasma membranes, in fact, are going to be very thin. They're going to contain lipids. And they're going to come in what we call a bilayer. Now, I just threw a bunch of stuff there at you, and we're going to break this down as we go forward here. So first of all, thin. What does that actually mean? On the order of 5 to 10 nanometers in thickness. Now, we already referenced a width or a, a length measurement called a nano or a micrometer, and now I'm bringing up this term nanometer. So what exactly is a nanometer? You can fit a thousand nanometers in a micrometer. So now we're at a million nanometers in a millimeter. So think about a millimeter. So you could fit a thousand thousands inside of a millimeter. I mean, this is mind-boggling stuff, right? So 5 to 10 nanometers in thickness. So this is really, really thin. It's a lipid bilayer, and I'm going to come back to that here in just a minute. Uh, but in, another thing that we need to identify about plasma membranes and about the cell membrane specifically is it separates two different what I'm going to call compartments. In the case of the cell membrane, It separates, the, it separates the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. I'm going to always abbreviate the intracellular fluid, the ICF, which is what we're going to find inside of the cell. 
we can also call it the cytosol. Extracellular fluid is going to be what we find around the cell. So it's a barrier between the intercellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. Now, if we're talking about plasma membrane for, let's say, endoplasmic reticulum, this would separate the intracellular fluid from the fluid inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, I called it a lipid bilayer. And mostly they are composed, uh, plasma membranes and the cell membrane uh, specifically are composed of lipids, uh, especially a class of lipid called a phospholipid. Now, lipid is one of our major macromolecules in biology. And it goes alongside carbohydrates, amino acids, and nucleic acids, and it has some very specific chemical characteristics. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those chemical characteristics in just a minute. So mostly lipids, and there's a variety of different types of lipids. One of the most common is going to be the phospholipid. And this is going to be a lipid that's associated with a phospho uh, or a, uh, a phosphorus functional group. So we have a phosphate attached to the lipid. Now, the thing that's really important about that chemical group, the phosphochemical group, is it makes the lipid more reactive, and it can interact with a larger number of molecules. So embedded within the lipids and attached to phospholipids, we're also going to find in plasma membranes some proteins and also some carbohydrates or saccharides. Okay? And we're going to, again, we're going to address each of these as we move forward here in the next couple of minutes.